to uh, Beatrice Banacher, uh, who is an assistant professor of crimes and Lightning literature and culture at KU Leuven. Her doctoral dissertation dealt with fictional representations of cultural identity and cultural transfer in 18th century prose fiction. And her research interests and results include the transcultural history of early modern fiction, literary translation, and the policy construction in 18th century women's writing. She also, with Lisa Foundation, works on a recently approved project uh, titled Founding Translation. A project that will be presented uh, in fact later by uh, Mel Boyer. But right now it's uh, time for Beatrice Banacher, who is going to speak about stating the translator in the works and letters of Maria Elizabeth de la Fee. So I think that we can start with the presentation. I yes, I am going to start to share the perfect. It's this one, right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So I think that everybody can see the the presentation. That's right. Yes. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So everyone can see that I actually was mistaken uh, um, as far as the date is concerned. I was already thinking of our Syrian conference in a month, <laughs> but I did not change my title though. Um, okay. Uh, thanks also uh, on my behalf uh, for inviting us and having us here for this uh, seminar. Um, so I will be talking about staging the translator in the works and letters of Marie Elisabeth de la Chite. And I will start by uh, a quote. I also have to look uh, where to put the. Yes. Uh, so it's a quote in French, but I will uh, read it in, in English. Is it true that women have not invented anything? I almost believe so. We know how to embroider the canvas and artfully adorn the musseline fabric, but we would never have imagined the weaver's skill. These are the first lines of Marie-Elisabeth Lafitte's fourth letter in Lettres sur divers sujets, a collection of critical essays on moral and literary subjects, published in 1775 in The Hague. This quote interests me for two reasons. First, it is a telling example of Latvi's literary practice as an 18th century translator and writer who incessantly crossed both geographical and linguistic borders in her work and life. As I will explain later on, this particular work, for instance, oscillates between original and translation, not just through its form, but also in terms of content. Second, in this particular perspective, the quote, so the one I just uh, told you about by Lafitte could also be read as a metaphorical depiction of one of the most predominant views on translation as a gendered practice at the time, which was based on the distinction between original writing as an act of genius and creativity. See, for instance, the terms uh, invention imaginée, uh, intrinsically linked to the weaver's skill, and translation as a subservient practice, for instance, orner la mousseline, a lot as to women, who, as was the general assumption, lacked the quality of invention. Whereas at first sight, Lafitte appears to subscribe to this gendered vision, her somewhat hesitant answer, je le crois presque, I must think so, to the opening question leaves some room for interpretation. More importantly still, as I will explain in my talk today, it is through a hybrid literary practice where translation and invention often met to coincide that Lafitte herself challenged this gendered binary distinction. In my talk uh, for today's seminar, I will present some findings from my ongoing research into the life and work of German-born, French-speaking Marie-Elisabeth de Lafitte, translator, journalist, writer, and governess, who lived in The Hague, in the Netherlands, during a crucial, a crucial period of her career. By analyzing both paratextual and uh, paratextual material and private correspondence, I hope to highlight how translation as a relational practice played a formative role in the shaping of Lafitte's life and career. The central question will then be the following. Why and how Lafitte, as many other women, used translation as a negotiation space in order to actively shape what could be defined as her posture, I will come back to that, as a translator, in terms of a relational and a dynamic process of self-definition and self-affirmation. As such, this research question takes form against the background of specific developments and findings within and at a crossroads between the fields of translation studies and gender studies. 
In the first part of my presentation, I will just briefly sketch some of these findings and ideas, which will then serve as the backbone for the microhistory of Lafitte I'm currently working on. First, I would like to briefly remind you that within the field of translation history, researchers have come to focus increasingly on the particularities of translation as a ubiquitous practice, which was central to the intellectual life of early modern Europe. This was a period of looking forward, characterized by a rise in vernacular cultures, and also of looking back to the rediscovery and redeployment of previous, often classical works. One of the central arguments often addressed by scholars working on early modern cultures of translation concerns the so-called visibility and agency of the translator as a co-creative instance. Whereas the seminal work by Lawrence Venuti, for instance, the translator's invisibility has proven fruitful in laying bare the particular challenges faced by translators in modern times, early modern translations seldom prove to be faithful renditions of the original. As such, they could provide a maneuvering space for creativity to eager and upcoming writers seeking to make their claim to literary fame. As a result of the growing interest in the early modern as a particularly vibrant period of translation, the many roles adopted by translators, not just as transmitters, but also as cultural brokers or mediators more in general, have been increasingly brought to the attention. Thereby, both the individual agency of particular translators and the collective or collaborative force of their cultural networks have become a privileged object of study. In the case of Lafitte II, her personal agency appears to have been intensely linked to and thrived on the existence of a network that was both political and intellectual by nature. But then why focus on women translators? As some of you might already know, the first influential studies on early modern women translators came already in the wake of the feminist literary project in the 1970s, which sought to counter male-dominated canons by reclaiming lost female voices. Theoretical impetus came, amongst others, from an article by Laurie Chamberlain on gender and the metaphorics of translation, which identified a sexualized conceptualization of translation through history according to which, for instance, the use of certain metaphors, think of the Belle d'un Fidel, served to oppose the inferior reproductive feminine translation to the superior productive masculine original. These early studies already called for investigations into the role of silent forms of writing, such as translation in articulating women's speech and subverting hegemonic uh, forms of expression, as Hilary Brown reminds us. In this respect, Sherry Simon's study, Gender in Translation, which you see on the left, on the role of translation for women's literary careers in different periods is crucial in its, reflection, uh, in its reflection on translation, quote, as an intensely relational act, one which establishes connections between sex and culture, between author and reader. This relational perspective is also central to a chapter in Julie Kendler Hayes' work, Translation, Subjectivity and Culture in France and England, as you see on your right hand um, side which focuses on 17th and 18th century British and French female translators. Hayes convincingly posits a link between women's creative and self-affirmative use of the translator's middle voice and the intellectual context of the early modern period. By Hayes' definition, I think I have a quote, yes. By Hayes' definition, the concept middle voice designates something between active and passive, that is to say, forms of authorial agency within translation. As a gender-specific version of the concept of the translator's voice, it also allows to focus on the translator's discursive articulation of agency and attitude in the paratext, and to conceptualize this discourse in terms of a mediation of other voices and counter-discourses. It should also be noted that in relation to the question of gender within translation studies, no part of history has received more attention than the early modern period and increasingly the Enlightenment, not in the least for quantitative reasons. As Hilary Brown mentioned in a recent contribution to the Rutledge Handbook of Translation, Feminism and Gender, scholars have been intrigued by the numbers of women who emerge as translators as the Renaissance and Reformation, and one could extend that to uh, the Enlightenment spread through Europe from queens and aristocrats to members of scholarly families and those with more humble and obscure roots. It has long been established that translating was a zone more accessible to women, precisely because of its supposedly marginal position. More recently, and precisely by looking at early modern practices, women translators' agency has gained even more emphasis, not just as individuals, but also in collaborations. 
Now, these rather recent shifts towards the conceptualization of translation as a creative and a collaborative practice also provide a theoretical backbone for my analysis of Lafitte's life and work. Not just because through her work, she is a telling example of the 18th century predominant vision of translation as a creative writing practice, but also because she appears to have forged her posture as a writer in a productive connection to her role as a translator. Before addressing this hybrid authorial self-representation, I would like to draw your attention to some key concepts which in my research have somehow helped me to define this particular practice. Concepts of relational authority and that of the translator's posture. In this broadest sense, authority is at play in the working of power relations, be they political, social or cultural. It also refers to the relevance of specific knowledge or expertise as a means towards external recognition, be it in a particular discipline or in society at large. In the works of French philosoph uh, philosophers and sociologists such as Jean-Pierre Le Clairou or Pierre Bourdieu, authority is designated as a quality, a credit, negotiated and achieved through association with different types of connections. Informed by the search for recognition by others, authority construction thus implies the use of relational ties and hence turns into a dynamic and dialogical process in which both representations of the self and others, the interior and the exterior, and the individual and collective interact. Although during the early modern period, the creation of the public persona, Lika already discussed this, gradually became more acceptable, for women writers also, a devoid of inherent forms of authority, one of the ways in which the search for fame and recognition took form was through association with other more renowned writers and intellectuals. In Lafitte's case, this maneuvering will appear both from her constant repositioning in the paratext, as well, in her, as, well as in her works as such, but also through comments on literary translation in her letters, which were often expressed in relation to other actors with whom she corresponded. These self-representations could also evolve from one work to another, depending on cultural dynamics, genre constraints, or as a result of their own intellectual and artistic repositioning over time. Posture then. As for the notion of translatorial posture, for this concept, I and our team, you could say, draws on insights from discourse analysis and sociology. In his seminal work on the discursive and social dynamics of authorial self-representation, sociologist Jérôme Mezo defines posture as an author's particular way of staging and positioning him or herself in the literary field, mostly through the projection of both discursive self-images and self-fashioning outside the works. When applied to the work and position of Lachite, the concept allows me to investigate the overall dynamic interplay between the discursive construction within the author's and translated text and an agency that is constructed outside of the published text, as in her letters, for instance. Now to Lachite. I will also start by a brief uh, biography. Marie-Elisabeth de Lachite, née Marie-Elisabeth Boudoué, author, translator, and governess, was born on August 21st, 1737, sorry, in Hamburg. Daughter of Alexandre, Alexandre Le Boué and uh, Marie-Elisabeth uh, Cotin. Both parents originated from the Bordeaux area and were Protestants. She had a brother and two sisters, with whom she later maintained a correspondence, unfortunately lost. As a young woman, she was one of the 40 muses and graces of the poet Friedrich Gottlieb Klopstock. In 1768, she married Jean Daniel de Lafitte, pastor of the Walloon Church and chaplain to the House of Orange. De Lafitte had three children, an infant buried uh, in 1769, uh, a daughter, Marie uh, Elise, and a son, Henri Alexandre, the only one to survive his parents. Marie Elizabeth's marriage to Jean Daniel, Daniel de Lafitte caused her to join the Huguenot community in The Hague before she left for England after her husband's untimely death in 1781. I will come back to that. As I will illustrate later, Lafitte's peregrinations from the German countries to the Low Countries and then to England significantly influenced her works. Her life as an emigre made her also unusually well qualified for her role as a cultural mediator. In Lafitte's case, mediation implied translating work from mostly German and some English authors, while also freely adapting some of their work to insert it in her so-called original, mostly educational writing. This focus on mediation of other writers and translators, often in close connection with her overt self-positioning, also appears from the scattered correspondence she left. 
Some of her letters were addressed to discuss her work and career plans with the intellectual community, as well as with some writers abroad whose work she was translating. Others served to establish relationships in view of professional advancement. What follows, I will first focus on how Lafitte's paratext and letters attest to a constant search of uh, relational authority construction. And in the second part, I will um, show how this mediating role is also deeply embedded in her writing. So in many ways, Lafitte's time at The Hague was formative of her career as a celebrated translator. The Northern Low Countries were internationally renowned for their vibrant printing business, which, uh, sorry, I probably should have skipped. Yes. Uh, the Hague was at the crossroads of European diplomacy, the center through which envoys and couriers were constantly passing. And both North and South served as a shelter for many French speaking emigres, many of whom prominent intellectuals such as Feller, Linguet, Pierre Rousseau, but also Jean de Lafitte, Mary Elizabeth's husband. These intellectuals also uh, temporarily entrusted their publications and thriving journals to local printers. More generally, there appears to have been in the Low Countries a sharp interest in ideas, texts, and genres from abroad, but also a particular readiness to implement these in the local culture. Although Francophone herself, Lafitte certainly mingled with the local intellectual community in the Low Countries. As clearly appears from letters to and by Dutch philosopher François Hemsterhuis and Dutch scholar Reiklo van Goes. At the same time, she also established a firm epistolary network of literary and, and political connections abroad with, for instance, Swiss writer and philosopher Jasper Lavata, German writers Martin Wieland and Sophie von La Roche, as well as Princess Adelheid Amalia von Schmetter, wife of Prince Dimitri Galitsi. Part of these connections she managed to create through her husband, who at the very end of his life obtained an important position as chaplain in the intimate circles of Dutch stadtholder William V. These connections ascertained Lafitte's introduction into the royal family, with direct ties to the House of Hanover and, through Queen Charlotte, to the English court. They were a significant advancement for Lafitte's own life and career, and it is through these connections that she managed to obtain a role or a position as reader to the royal princesses in London from the 1780s onwards. On a purely intellectual level also, the Dutch period proved crucial, since it is then that she collaborates with her husband in founding a literary and scientific journal. That, yeah, so this was uh, Queen Charlotte and then uh, William. So this is the, uh, the journal I'm talking about. Um, La Bibliothèque des Sciences et des Beaux-Arts, printed and distributed for the French community in The Hague. This journal contained many lengthy reviews and excerpts from foreign works with a strong interest in German sentimental, moral and philosophical literature, and a particular focus on translation. Undoubtedly, it is as an active collaborator that she developed her skills as a translator and cultural mediator. Indeed, several comments in letters by close contacts confirmed that Lafitte was in fact directing the journal and used her elaborate networks, both local and international, to gather appropriate content. She, for instance, provides a review of Sophie von La Roche, celebrated sentimental novel, Geschichte des Fräuleins von Sternheim, which she translates into French later on. While still in The Hague, Lafitte then accepts to render Johann Caspar Lavater's Physionomische Fragmente into French. As is assisted in several letters by François Hemsterhuis at that time, this ambitious translation project in different volumes was presumably carried out in collaboration with her husband, and it took up an important part of her time while in The Hague. This collaboration between husband and wife is also hinted at in one of Lafitte's letters to her, oops, sorry, I have to move forward, to her, um, to Reikloff Michael van Hoes. I will not uh, read this, it just simply says that she uh, collaborates with her husband on this. It is also in the same period that she published her first works, uh, not signed as a translator, but as an author, among which her Lettre sur l'hiver sujet, from which I quoted at the beginning of my talk. Yet, uh, before further engaging with, uh, with uh, the fiction and the, and the works, uh, I would like to give you a few examples of how Lafitte succeeded in establishing her own position as a woman of letters through what I defined as a practice of relational authority construction. I will do this by looking at some of the paratexts in her work. From her very first published translation of Sophie von La Roche, highly popular Geschichte des Fräuleins von Sternmann, onwards, Lafitte indeed provided lengthy paratexts, which were occasionally also signed by other renowned authors whose laudatory words mainly served to add to her own reputation and the work's luster. <laughs> 
For instance, this is the first example, one of our most successful educational works, Eugénie et ses was preceded by an elaborate preface, signed by Stéphanie Félicité de jean Lys, who was one of the most widely read and celebrated writers of that time. The choice of jean Lys, which is made explicit in a footnote, as you can see on the very first page, is evidently linked to jean Lys' intellectual reputation in the Republic of Letters. Interestingly, however, in this preface, jean Lee herself produces a fascinating va-et-vient, an oscillation between overt endorsement of Lafitte and critical distance, when she observes only to have made changes to the work's form and not to its contents, although she deemed it necessary. In the second part of her preface, jean Lee then uses the paratextual space to firmly consolidate her own position as a woman writer par excellence and as a literary critic, uh, as a literary critic by means of a lengthy overview of the women's writing that was published at her time. Whereas this attached preface at first hints at a fruitful collaboration between both women writers, it does, and perhaps surprisingly, also reads as a form of self-promotion by jean Lee. In this case, relational authority seems to have worked both ways. Now, while it's interesting to see that Lafitte still heavily relies on such strategies um, at a later time in her career, the abundant paratext for her very first publication, the French translation of Von La Roche Sternheim, is an even more compelling illustration of paratextual maneuvering. Sternheim was first published and presented by Christophe Martin Wieland, who served as the novel's actual editor and many readers indeed wrongly attributed the work to him and considered his stance to be that of an imaginary editor, while the novel was in fact written by von La Roche herself. Interestingly, in her own process of translating the novel into French, Lafitte reached out to Wieland to ask for his permission, as well as, a, as, well as his opinion on certain aspects of the translation. Even if, by the time the French translation was published, the true identity of Stenheim's author was already well known, and Lafitte hints uh, at this uh, in one of her footnotes, Lafitte, she chose to include her correspondence to Wieland, both her initial letter and his answer, in the paratext of her French translation. Visibly capitalizing on the German writer's intellectual authority, um, this series of letters also serves to mark Lafitte's own public introduction into literature, since it already contains some of the main characteristics and strategies on which she would later go on to build her career. For instance, the letter she writes to Wieland strongly emphasizes her role as a mother and an educator, and this articulation between didactic, moral, and personal motives is often referred to in her later writings. The paratext with Schoenheim also contains references to her ties with the royal family. She, for instance, explicitly mentioned that it is through her that Sternheim came into the hands of the Dutch princesses. On late, in later, later works also, Lafitte overtly states her connections to members of the royal family, mostly by means of dedications. For instance, her Entretien, Drame et Comte Moreau, published in 1778, shows a lengthy dedication to Queen Charlotte, a few years before Lafitte would actually leave the Low Countries to join the household of Queen Charlotte in Great Britain as a reader to the queen and instructors to the princesses in German and French. So there's a mixed strategy of intellectual, moral, and political authority shaping that will prove to be the solid foundation of her later career. Thus, Lafitte's polyphonic paratexts are clearly orchestrated in such a way as to reflect the literary circles she frequents, while also accompanying her gradual emergence as a woman of letters. Now, for this talk, I've chosen to focus on printed sources, but there's a lot that one can learn from her admittedly scattered correspondence with some prominent intellectuals in the German countries, France, and the Low Countries. Likewise, it's very interesting to analyze and compare the textual portraits of Lafitte that some of these authors, men and women, created in their own letters and journals. In the case of Lafitte, many of these ego documents corroborate the image of a particularly dynamic woman eagerly using personal and professional ties that proved beneficial, not just to the transcultural circulation of literature, but also to her personal advancement. In this respect, there are also some intriguing dissimilarities to be mentioned. For instance, between Sophie von La Roche's Tagebuch, Eine Reise durch Holland und England, in which, um, sorry, I should have, yes, um, I skipped a few. So this is the dedication uh, to uh, Queen Charlotte. Um, and uh, this is Francis Burney's uh, uh, court journals, uh, in which he refers to uh, Lafitte in very negative terms. I will probably just paraphrase this 
Um, and, uh, and this is a quote from uh, Sophie Van La Roche's Tagebuch, uh, in which she also very much positions Lafitte as a, uh, as a, um, as a, as a very dynamic uh, cultural mediator, but mostly in positive terms, right? Uh, so there's a very interesting um, perspective that comes out of, of, of uh, comparing uh, these, um, these ego documents. So I will skip the very negative account uh, by Francis Burney, who was a colleague of Lafitte at the, uh, at the English royal household, uh, to, uh, to come to the second part of, of my analysis. Which are the uh, which is the the staging of the translator in the in the fiction. Now, what these accounts, as well as the paratext I quoted earlier, hopefully help to illustrate is that Lafitte's cultural mediatorship was not just a matter of transferring text from one culture to another, um, but also that as an emigre writer whose financial means and career as an educator depended heavily on her social networks, she was evidently compelled to incorporate these in her paratext thus also shaping her costume as a translator and writer in relation to the intellectual, social, and political authority provided by others. Yet, perhaps even more interesting is the fact that the very character, so there's a, a character, a personage, a character of the translator, um, and you can actually call her a female educator, translator, writer, uh, was consequently implemented in the narrative construction of her authored writing. So she translated, but she also published uh, collections of uh, moral tales and plays in which she often stages this main character who is also a translator, right? And who um, was very much characterized, drawn on, or based on uh, Lafitte's own biography. So there is like a very interesting link between life and, uh, and writing and between original and translation. So it's this fictional translator who reintroduces uh, this gendered perspective on translatorship within the work itself. We noted this, for instance, in the sartorial metaphor, which I quoted at the beginning of my talk, right? Uh, so this is, this is the quote, sorry. I already mentioned this. Rather than pointing towards a lack of creativity, which would be inherent to female nature, when examined within its broader context, this quote could rather be interpreted as one among several indications that Lafitte adhered to a more positive view on translation, highlighting its originality and creative power. More generally speaking, the recurrent role of the translator character seems to underwrite the idea that for Lafitte, women's participation in the literary field lied precisely in the role of the transmitter, of the mediator, be it as an educator in passing on specific knowledge to younger generations, or as a translator in making thought-provoking work available to new audiences. This perspective is made very tangible throughout Lafitte's work, not in the least because in her work, the task of the translator is never defined in terms of a faithful rendering of source text, but as an active reworking of the original to meet new expectations, for instance, through freely reassembling different source texts. More generally, it's interesting to see how in Lafitte's fictions, the translatorial posture, which she carefully sets out in her letters and paratexts, comes full circles. In, comes full circle, sorry. In two of her collections of tales and plays, Entretien, Drame et Comte Marot, Moreau, and Eugénie des Eleves, the character of the translator is staged as the ideal governess, not just in the sense that she builds on her extensive knowledge of foreign sources to better educate her pupils. Now, the act of translation as such is accredited a particular didactic purpose, in that it allows pupils to creatively engage with source material from different cultural backgrounds in their search for knowledge, and to find a sense of autonomy in their reading. In Entretien, for instance, the translator, um, yes, so these are the three uh, collections of, of, uh, of uh, moral tales and, and plays. Uh, yes, this is the last quote um, before I go to my conclusion. Uh, so let me see where was I. In uh, Entretien, for instance, the tr translator repeatedly emphasizes her very liberal take on translation. For instance, she fait de grands changements, j'ai beaucoup retranché et beaucoup ajouté. And frequently comments on this practice. At some point, she then qu uh, quite literally disappears from the scene under the pretense of being too occupied by translating activities, encouraging her pupils to discuss the works by themselves, while also translating them for future generations during her absence. 
In the same way, and this is the quote, we read in Eugénie de Villers, how one of the central characters, Madame Bologna, advises one of her pupils to devote her free time not just to reading, but more importantly to translating as a noble act of cultural and intellectual transmission to future generations. We quote, you've mastered knowledge in more than one genre and you chose your reading carefully. However, continuous reading is but one occupation which cannot fill all free time, and I aspire to some variation. For instance, the advantage of knowing several languages allows you to translate them. And in this, I find yet another way for you to do good. In introducing useful works to them, your children, you will do a crucial favor to those who are less educated than you. In other words, in Lafitte's work, translation requires an important level of creative engagement with the source text for it to serve the didactic and uh, emancipatory objective by which it is informed. The trans law for thus emerge, emerges as the ultimate intellectual companion. I'll come to my conclusion. What do I hope to have illustrated uh, in this talk? If my main hypothesis is indeed that women more than their male colleagues required a relational form of authority construction, in my analysis of Marie Elisabeth de la Fitte's work, I've tried to explore how this materializes in a hybrid writing practice, often emanating from a middle voice, as Candler Hayes would describe it, that involves a multifarious staging of the translation. What I've discussed in the first part of my talk is proved to be particularly performative in a historical context where the boundaries between genres and the status of texts were often indistinct. In her writing and letters, Lafitte clearly and cleverly navigated between original and translation, between self and the other, between multiple languages, and ultimately also between a gendered and a non-gendered perspective on authorship and writing. Thus emerges a form of hybrid agency that was always in part relational and at times collective rather than individual. Additionally, by choosing to not closely compare source and target text, but rather to embed my research in a broader examination of the network Lafitte participated in, as reflected in letters, paratexts, and even in fictionalized accounts, I hope to have illustrated the importance of piecing together different sources, both fictional and non-fictional, not only to reconstruct the multi-layered and dynamic nature of these trans for self-representational strategies, but also to better understand their effectiveness in examining how they were perceived, received, and circulated at that time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beatrice.